But they cried out the more, saying, Let him be crucified. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. We have reached the end of Lent. We have arrived at the liturgical week when the Church commemorates the mystery of the redemption of mankind. Today we commemorate, mourning in black vestments, the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. This act of redemption took place on Mount Calvary by the crucifixion. Before expelling Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden, upon the fall, God promised to them, and in them to all the human race, a Savior, a Redeemer. Our blessed Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is the Redeemer of mankind. In fact, the very name of Jesus means Savior, because he saved us from cell and hell. The word Christ means the anointed king, because the kings in the Old Testament were anointed with oil, a symbol of power. According to the mystery of the redemption, We have it that Christ suffered and died for our sins. What does it mean that Jesus died for our sins? It means that we can be saved through the death of Christ if we believe in Christ and do what he told us. Observe this difference between Catholics and non-Catholics on this point. Non-Catholics believe that God will save us by simply believing in Christ. Catholics, on the other hand, believe that we must believe and do what he told us to do. Original sin, committed by Adam and Eve, and inherited by all their descendants, together with all other personal sins, required a sufficient or adequate reparation and satisfaction to God. Mortal sin is an infinite offense from the point of view of the offended majesty of God, the axiom being that the gravity of the offense is taken from the dignity of the offended. But the person of God is infinite, therefore mortal sin is an infinite offense from this angle of consideration. This is the mystery of the redemption, that God chose a certain, most excellent way of paying that due reparation through the life, passion, and death of Jesus Christ on the cross. Some say that Jesus, by his death, satisfied for our sins. Our good works, therefore, are useless. No, Jesus made satisfaction for our sins, but on condition that we, too, make some satisfaction. Because he told us to do penance, to take up our cross daily, to watch and pray, to love our neighbor, etc. But if we, too, are to make satisfaction. It seems the satisfaction of Christ was not sufficient. The satisfaction of Jesus was sufficient, but he wishes that we do some penance in order to see whether we are worthy of his infinite satisfaction, because he said, Not he that says, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doth the will of my Father who is in heaven. Here is a difficult and important question. Would God have become man if Adam and Eve had not sinned? The short answer is no. The reason is that we can only know through revelation those things which proceed from the will of God. But revelation assigns only the motive of the reparation of sin for the incarnation. In other words, the best way to free mankind from the eternal punishments due to sin was through the Incarnation and the Act of Redemption. Let me explain the premise that necessitated such a drastic measure to rescue us. 
that being the gravity and the effects of original sin, and of any mortal sin, really. Original sin is inherited from our parents, all the way up to Adam and Eve. And we are brought into this world with its guilt on our souls. There is no escaping it. Our souls then come into existence with a certain wicked state marring and staining them. This original sin chiefly consists in the loss of sanctifying grace, a grace that makes us holy and pleasing to God. God was infinitely displeased with Adam and Eve on account of original sin, and this displeasure affected all their children. This displeasure is taken away through Jesus Christ when we are baptized. Because Adam and Eve deserted God and obeyed Satan, they lost their primeval innocence and holiness and were doomed to sickness and death. On account of their first sin, in addition to our own personal sins, we in turn have to suffer and die. God said, Cursed is the earth and thy work, thorns and thistles shalt it bring forth to thee, and the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return to the earth, out of which thou wast taken, for dust thou art, and into dust thou shalt return. It is appointed unto men once to die. By sin death entered into the world. Therefore, it is on account of the disobedience of our first parents that we all share in their sin and punishment. This corruption of our nature and other punishments remain in us even after original sin has been forgiven. Hence, man is naturally inclined to evil. That is fallen human nature. We clearly see here there was and is an imperative necessity to make reparation to God for sin. But in order to make perfect satisfaction for sin, it was necessary that there be someone capable of an infinite act of reparation, therefore God. Yet at the same time, capable of representing the human race, therefore man. Thus was the incarnation necessary. This is how the Incarnation was the best and most suitable way God chose for the redemption. On this note, St. Ignatius vividly tells us that Jesus Christ stripped himself of his bliss, which was infinite, in order to make us partakers of it and to associate us as his companions in it taking for himself our miseries and burdening himself with them to remove them from our shoulders. Now that we have cleared these premises by the explanation of original sin and its consequences, of the necessity of the incarnation and the method of redemption of mankind, let us examine a little closer to what lengths Jesus went in redeeming us. To begin, we know that the primary and fundamental concept in the notion of redemption is satisfaction, which together with sacrifice belongs to the essence of redemption. Thus it is of faith that Christ is a priest and that he offered himself on the altar of the cross, a sacrifice in the true and strict sense. The Council of Ephesus teaches that Christ is our High Priest and Apostle, who offered himself for us an odor of sweetness to God. Why did Christ suffer so much, when the least of his acts of love superabundantly sufficed for the salvation of men? The answer lies in three points, regarding ourselves, regarding himself, and regarding the Father. As regard ourselves, it was fitting for Christ to suffer in so many ways and to the utmost, so that he might give us the supreme example of love. As regards Christ the Savior, 
it befitted him to suffer in many ways, and in the highest degree, so that he might most perfectly accomplish his glorious mission as a savior of the whole human race. As regards God the Father, it was fitting that the Father should deliver up his Son to the greatest suffering, so that Christ, by this sorrowful way, might attain to the greatest of all glory, namely, victory over sin, the devil, and death. The Passion marks the culminating point of the work that Christ came to do here below. It is the hour wherein Christ consummates the sacrifice that is to give infinite glory to his Father, to redeem humanity, to reopen to mankind the fountains of everlasting life. In conclusion, that God should redeem man at all, that he should make atonement for the sins of mankind, is evidence of infinite mercy. But the fact that God should have chosen this special way, the incarnation of his divine Son, is evidence of his stupendous love for the creature of his hand. It is the answer to heaven, to the cravings, the longings of man, an answer to be conceived only in the divine mind. Religion, in its very essence, implies a loving creature and a loving God. And the history of man's spiritual life has been a series of cravings and a series of answers. Coming to redeem our sinful race and to enlighten a world seated in darkness and in the shadow of death, as St. John described it, Jesus began his work of reformation by preaching his first sermon from the pulpit of the manger. It was pride and sensuality that caused the fall of our race. And pride and avarice and sensuality were the great evils of his day, as they are also of the days in which we live. St. Paul, in his epistle to the Romans, gives us a sad picture of the degraded condition to which pagan Rome had brought itself through these three vices. What was true of pagan Rome was true of other ancient cities of the world. It is true of our cities today. Pride, avarice, and sensuality are the ruling gods of our age. It is for this reason our Lord came in humility, in poverty, and in suffering, to condemn the vices that lead most men to their eternal ruin. His whole life, filled with so many sufferings, great and small, culminating with his death on Golgotha, all add up to the act of redemption upon his holy cross from the manger to Calvary. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.